August 6, 1945, more than one million people changed in the blink of an eye. Seconds before, overhead, the American bomber, the Enola Gay, had dropped the first atomic bomb. The result was the death of hundreds of thousands of people. People were incinerated instantaneously. Some of them, their shadows today are still etched on the walls of buildings. Others were killed as buildings crumbled or by the massive radiation that followed the explosion. The bomb ended the war. But it had another effect as well. It motivated the people who had survived the explosion to protest the accumulation of nuclear bombs. These victims and survivors of unnatural devastation brought with them the memories of family, friends, and lives destroyed. They bore the scars of their physical suffering on their bodies. To anyone who saw them, it was apparent that they had been through a tremendous ordeal. To anyone who would listen, they had an incredible story of suffering and pain to tell. But more than the story, more than the scars, was what most drastic about these people is, is that their experience forever changed them. No longer were they content to live their lives in obscurity. The world had to know what they went through. No longer would they keep their opinions to themselves. The people of the world had to know. Well, in April or May of the year 33 AD, a group of people was changed as well in the blink of an eye. Seconds before, they had been praying in an upper room when all of a sudden wind from God blew through the building, flames like fire ignited above their heads, and they heard themselves speaking in languages that they had not known the moment before. Pentecost had arrived, and these people were changed. Out the doors they ran, into the crowded streets of the city of Jerusalem. Pentecost ended the isolation of the disciples, but it had another effect as well. Those who experienced that day's happenings, they began proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ wherever they went. They brought with them memories of Jesus' life. They had the evidence of the Pentecost experience all over them. To anyone who heard them, it was apparent they had been through an incredible experience. To anyone who would listen to them, they had an incredible story of grace and mercy that went with them. But more than the story, more than the languages that they spoke about the encounter, what was most drastic was that the experience changed them forever. No longer were they content to live their lives in a little upper room. The world had to know. No longer would they keep the story of Jesus to themselves. The world had to know. No longer would they dream of going back to the good old days with Jesus. The world had to know. Pentecost and Hiroshima, both explosions had drastic results. Both altered people's lives and both motivated people to stand up, speak up, and seek out those who needed to hear. Today is Pentecost. It's the day when we celebrate and remember the birth of the church. But there's more to this date than just remembrance the same explosive experience is available today because Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. That same fire, that same passion, that same atomic bomb of the church is available for those within the church today. But what is it? That's what we're going to look at today. Because I can't make the assumption that everybody here knows. I can't make the assumption that everybody here has grown up in the Pentecostal church and knows because the reality is I didn't grow up in the Pentecostal church and I had no idea. Nobody explained it to me. Nobody told me that it wasn't something to be afraid of. Nobody told me that it was something that was subsequent to getting saved. Nobody told me what to expect. Nobody told me that my life would be forever changed for the good.
If you have your Bibles, I'd like you to turn to Acts chapter 2. We're going to look at verses 1 to 21. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. And suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. And they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem some God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. Why? Because it was Passover. And when they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. And utterly amazed, they asked, aren't these who are speaking all Galileans, then how is it that each one of us is hearing them in our native language? There's Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia and Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia and Phrygia and Pamphylia and Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jew and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun and said, <laughs> they, they've had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven and raised his voice and addressed the crowd, fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk like you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken of by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Father, this morning, Pentecost is something that every church celebrates one way or another, but for us, it's got a little bit more importance. God, I pray that you help me to clearly explain today what it is and what it's not. Help me to remove the, the, the weirdness and the kookiness and the, the magic of it. Help me to make sure that we keep the majesty and the grandeur and the grace of it. In Jesus' name, amen. There are three realities to the Pentecostal experience that need to be examined because they're the ones that are called into question the most today. The first one is this. Pentecost is experiential. In verses 1 to 4, we read the description of what happened on that day so long ago. All of them were gathered together. How many were there? Well, according to Acts 1.15, it tells us there were 120 believers. Were they all there? Apparently. And as they were there, the sound of a mighty wind rushed into the room. Tongues of fire appeared over their heads, and they began to speak in different languages. Now, what does this tell you about the experience? It tells us it was just that. It was an experience. David, if you had been there, you would have been able to talk about it and would have been able to explain it and probably wouldn't have been able to explain it, but you would have told people what had happened. It's kind of like when you have an incredible holiday and you're like, well, you know, this happened. Oh, you had to be there. That's exactly what this is. It wasn't something simultaneous with salvation because these people were already believers. It wasn't something that they grew into. They didn't just, well, you know what? This morning I think I'm going to, you know, step into Pentecost. <laughs> didn't happen that way. It wasn't something that they would later question. Did I or didn't I? Did I or didn't I? No, they knew. They knew it had happened. It wasn't something they would write off as emotional hype. Oh, man, you, you know, Peter, you shouldn't have eaten that pizza last night. It was a little bit too much. No. It wasn't something that they would later claim was a hallucination. 
They heard the wind, they felt the wind, they saw the fire, and they heard the languages. This was no hallucination, it was experience. And there are those today that teach that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is synonymous with salvation. They happen at the same moment. And there are also those that teach that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is no longer experienced in the church. I don't normally get this blunt, but I'm going to. Those people are wrong. Now, how can I say that with certainty? Simple. Scripture says so. Listen to what Peter says in Acts chapter 2, verses 38 and 39. Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Right there. That's salvation. Repent and believe. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are afar off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. Does that sound like something that God was planning to just stop? No. In Acts chapter 10, Cornelius invites Peter to preach to a whole bunch of Gentiles. Ask him if this first Pentecost was a one-time event, because in verses 44 to 45 of Acts chapter 10, we read this. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on Gentiles. Why were they astonished? Because they were seeing these new believers were receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It was experiential. Ask the believers that Paul encountered in Ephesus if Pentecost was a one-time event. They believed in Jesus. They were believers in Christ. Paul placed his hands on them after they've come to faith in Christ, prayed, and the Holy Spirit came on them. It was experiential. And today, the same experience is available to the church as well. Ask anyone who has received the baptism if it really happened. They'll tell you it did. Ask anyone who have had that experience if it was a hallucination. No, it wasn't. Ask them if they changed their lives. Yeah, it did. And see if they believe that Pentecost was only for one time. No, it's an ongoing thing. It's a gift that God offers to the church today, and it's still an event in a believer's life that is experiential. Secondly, Pentecost is evidential. It's one thing to have an experience. I mean, hopefully the kids at camp this year will have an experience with God. But it's an entirely different thing to be able to prove that you had that experience. Many people claim to have been abducted by aliens, but they can't prove it. Many people believe they have seen Elvis, but he has left the building. The difference between an out-of-this-world experience and Pentecost is that God has given a sign to accompany the experience of Pentecost. Listen to verses 5 to 13. It says, While they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven... And when they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, aren't these all who are Galileans? Then how is it that we're hearing them in our own languages? And then it gives a list of a whole bunch of different languages. So this isn't just, you know, suddenly Scott and, and Dave over here speaking Spanish because we had Spanish worship up on the screen. It's not Cindy and Pam speaking French because they've been learning some French cuisine together. It's Dave speaking Gaelic and Caleb speaking Polish and Vi speaking Czech. And people go, you know, the look on their faces is like, I have no idea what's coming out of my mouth right now, but this is really, really weird. And it still happens today. When I was at Southside Pentecostal in Edmonton, in the middle of a morning service, I, I felt a familiar tug on my spirit that I was supposed to give a message in tongues. It hasn't happened often, but it has happened a few times. In a church of 600, I know that there are people there that can interpret, and so I was comfortable in doing it. And so I stood up and I gave a message in tongues. And I sat down. And somebody across the room stood up and gave the interpretation. 
didn't think too much of it. Service continued. Everybody felt blessed and edified. And after the end of the service, I stood up and I was getting ready to leave. And a lady behind me tapped me on the shoulder. And I turned around. And here was this beautiful African lady. And she was in tears. She looked at me and she said, that is the first time that I have ever heard the gospel preached in my tribal language. And I said, pardon me? She said, the message you gave in tongues, that was my tribal language. And I went, okay. And then a thought occurred to me. I said, was the interpretation accurate? And she said, yes. It was a little loosey-goosey, but it was accurate. I said, what do you mean loosey-goosey? And she said, well, it, English has so many words. I understood run. He said hurry. I'm like, oh, okay. But it still happens. I've heard of missionaries that go over to a country that they've never been to and they can fluently speak a language. It happens. Why? Because God is still the God of the miraculous. But, you know, what about speaking in tongues? I mean, Wayne, do you know how to speak Dutch? No. Pam, does he know how to speak English? <laughs> no. Please understand that if you and I had been in Jerusalem that day, one of those 120 would have been speaking English. Because English is a tongue. You want to know today why so many people are afraid of speaking in tongues? It's because we automatically assume that they were preaching the gospel in English. You're already speaking in tongues, folks, compared to the Hebrews. It's not something to be afraid of, but it is something to experience, and it is something that we can, we can prove has happened. You see, these disciples were behaving strangely. They weren't acting normally. They'd had a Pentecostal experience, and as they poured out into the streets, the citizens of Jerusalem were astounded. Were they drunk? No. They were filled with the Spirit of God. Were they speaking nonsense? <laughs> no, they weren't. They were speaking absolute languages. It's the divine sign which can prove that a person has been baptized in the Holy Spirit. Now, Paul talks in Corinthians about speaking in tongues of man and tongues of angels, because I got news for you. Not every tongue that you hear can be interpreted by somebody in your congregation today. Why? Because nobody knows what the Elamites sound like today. Nobody knows what the Philistines spoke back then. Nobody knows what some of those other tribes, the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Gigashites and the, all the ites, we don't know what they sounded like. So somebody today might be speaking a dead language. Well, okay, but is there such a thing? Yeah, there is. Did you realize that up until about 1960, Hebrew was a dead language? Nobody spoke it. But Hebrew is the only language in the world that has been resurrected and is now being spoken fluently. Jesus promised that this was going to come. In Acts 1, verses 4 and 5, he said, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift that my Father has promised, which you have heard me speak about. John baptized with water. In a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Luke, a historian, a doctor and a historian, repeatedly indicates that this is the sign that accompanies a baptism. Acts chapter 10, Acts 19, 1 Corinthians 14, 18. Why are tongues an indicator? Why does God use something that is so strange to indicate the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Why not love? You know, Ron, if you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, why, don't, why doesn't God just fill you with an overwhelming love for everybody? Or Jessica, why doesn't God just, you know, fill you with the ability to prophesy? Or Scott, maybe what if God baptized in the Holy Spirit and you could walk over and just touch everybody and heal them? Well, the reason is this. In James chapter 3, the brother of our Lord points out this. He says, the tongue is a fire. It's a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. Hell. 
All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind, but no human being, no human being can tame the tongue. God gave a sign by taming the very tongue that the Bible claims that no man can tame. You see, you can fake walking up and loving people. You can speak words of prophecy into somebody's life and they may not be accurate. You can walk up to somebody and say, you're healed in Jesus' name and keep on walking and they're not. But if you speak a tongue that somebody else has to interpret, it has to be something from God. Because you see, for example, my wife speaks German and I could make something up about what she says, but then she could turn and go, <laughs> no, that's not what I said. Don't be a putz. Okay? Every instance of the baptism of the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts directly or by inference speaks about tongues being the initial evidence of the baptism. Pentecost is evidential. Just like on the first day of Pentecost, people who experience Pentecost are given an evidence to prove that their experience is real. The third thing I want to point out is this. Pentecost is energizing. In the final verses that we're going to look at today, we see the other reality to Pentecost. Peter is preaching. Now, I don't know about you, but every time I read Acts chapter 2 and I see this part where Peter is preaching, I just want to jump up and yell hallelujah. I mean, if God can revolutionize Peter's life, he can do it to me too. If he can turn that braggart and that coward into a preacher who won't stop, he can do it to any one of us. Peter, who denied the Lord three times. Peter, the one who said, oh, Lord, I'll follow you all the way to the cross if that's what it takes. Peter, who was rough on the outside, but a wimp on the inside, is now preaching up a storm that makes Billy Graham blush. From hiding in a room to shouting hallelujah, from back rooms to boldness, from fearfulness to fearlessness, Peter is energized and empowered by the Holy Spirit and the world has never been the same. Peter was willing to risk everything from this point on. Peter now gets up and points a finger at the very people of Judea and blames them for the death of Christ before sharing them the way of, with them the way of salvation. In one morning, a fiery preacher was created. What made the difference? The Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God was teaching Peter and teaching people through Peter all at once. This was no longer the same man who had denied Jesus in the courtyard only a few days before. Pentecost is energizing. You see, I know people that have been baptized in the Holy Spirit, and yes, they may have spoken in a word or two of tongues at one point in time, but they've never done it since. Well, then what? But they've also never stopped telling people about Jesus ever since. Is love an indicator of the baptism? It's not the initial, but it is there. Is prophecy? It's not the initial, but it is there. Is healing? It's not the initial, but it is there. Because if there's one thing that the baptism of the Holy Spirit does, it gets us wanting, willing, desiring, and needing to tell people about Jesus. And he does that through all sorts of different ways. He does it through prophesying into someone's life, loving someone in the midst of their pain, healing them in the midst of their hurt, or whatever. Sometimes it's just giving a message that they need to hear. Pentecost is energizing. Jesus promised you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. But this isn't talking about the Holy Spirit coming into you. That takes place at salvation. This is about the Holy Spirit coming on you, empowering you and covering you and baptizing you for service. But what type of service? Well, Jesus answered that one too. Acts 1.8, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. The baptism is for boldness, to tell people what they need to hear, not what they want to hear. The power is to enable you to preach with conviction and power and love, but maybe I don't want to preach. 
I mean, let's be honest here. Some of us are introverts. We'd rather not preach. Matter of fact, you put me into a spotlight where I have to, I'm not very happy. Ask my daughter. She doesn't like it very much sometimes. But the fact is, is that all it takes is a visiting pastor going, Royal Rangers for boys and girls? Uh, and suddenly she's preaching. She's preaching. He may not like what she was preaching, but she was preaching. That's what the gospel is about. That's what Pentecost is about. It's to enable you to witness. The Spirit desires that all should be saved. But Paul says this in Romans 10, 14. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? How can they believe in the one whom they have not heard about? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? Connie, preach the gospel and if necessary, use words. Absolutely. Gloria, walk down the street, preach the gospel, and if you have to, tell them. That's how the introverts do it. The extroverts, you know, uh, those of us that are a little bit more outgoing, we, we don't really care. We'll use words as well. But for those of you that are a little bit more introverted, if that mechanic could notice that something happened in me, they can notice Jesus in you. But live in such a way that they have to ask, Trevin, what happened to you on the weekend? Because that's the open door. We are called to live in such a way that they have to ask. Because it's not enough to just show them, because I got news for you, I got an awful lot of dumb people in the world. Oh, look, this guy's really nice. Why? Ask why? No, I don't want to know why. Yeah, exactly, you don't want to know why. But we have to get past the point of them just seeing to telling them why. Because that's where we get to tell them about who. In ourselves, we don't really honestly want the dirty, rotten sinner to be saved. I mean, let, let's be honest. If we had 10 homeless people walk into this church right now who haven't bathed in two weeks, we wouldn't exactly feel very comfortable. But it's the love of Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit that would make us go, you know what? They need Jesus. They need Jesus. And that's more important than them getting some Axe body spray. And it's certainly more important that they come to know Christ and go to heaven than they stay ignorant and go to hell. In the early church, the baptism of the Holy Spirit was a, a normal result of salvation. It was as normal as water baptism. And it was something that the believers naturally desired and sought and prayed for. But you see, today we have got so many churches that don't preach it and they don't teach it and they don't talk about it. You got Baptist pastors that are like, well, you know what? You don't really need the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You have Presbyterians that, oh, no, that was just for back then. You have people that teach different things. And then we wonder why the church is weak. But please understand me. The fastest growing religious movement in the world is still the Pentecostal movement. It started with about 100 people back in 1900. And today it numbers well more than 300 million around the world. You go over to Africa, you go to Asia, you go to South America. It is not Calvinism. It is not legalism that is winning people to faith in Christ. It is the power of the Holy Spirit. He is still the only one that draws people in. He is still the only one who saves people. And he's still the only one who does miracles. We cannot do it in our own and we cannot do it on our own. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. Pentecost is experiential. If you haven't experienced it, you need to. Pentecost is evidential. If you can't point to a point in your life and say this is when it happened, then maybe it didn't happen and you need to get a refilling. And Pentecost is energizing. If you're feeling worn out and worn up, then you need to get refilled 
because Pentecost is also not a one-time event. We are told to be continually filled with the Holy Spirit. God is not a well that you are going to wear out. He is a never-ending cistern, and you cannot ever get enough of him. Pentecost is still necessary. It is still needed today, and it's needed in the church in North America more than ever before. So let's pray. Father, would you open up the heavens? Would, would you pour down the power of your spirit once again? You promised, Lord, that in the last days you would pour your spirit out on all men, on men and women, on children, on youths, on old people, on young people. God, would you just pour out your spirit? We need more than Sunday morning attendance, God. We need more than just opening our Bibles and, and reading the black on white. We need more than just bowing our heads and saying grace. We need a new encounter with the living God where like John, we would fall face down on the floor. Like Daniel, we would fall prostrate on the ground. Like Peter, like Thomas, we would cry out, my Lord and my God. We need to see. We need to know. We need a refilling of the Holy Spirit. We need, Father, to be empowered once again for witnessing in this area because men and women in this city need to know Jesus. People in our country need Jesus. Our government needs Jesus. And our world, Father, needs Jesus. Lord, this morning, I, I want to lift up the nation of China to you. They desperately need Jesus. They are under such lies and under such dominion they need Jesus. Father, I'm praying for Russia this morning. They need a breakthrough of truth. They need a breakthrough of grace. They need to know Jesus. I'm praying for Iran this morning, Father, and Afghanistan and, and other Muslim nations, Father, that they're under the, the, the thumb of deceit and lies. And God, we just pray that you would baptize them in the Holy Spirit and that you would break through in those countries. Father, I'm praying for countries in Europe that have gotten to the point where they are just stagnant in their faith. God, we need to know the power of God, not just the words of man. We need to know, we need to experience, we need to encounter the living God, once again, draw us back to yourself, Father, and draw all men to yourself. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you haven't sought to be filled with the Spirit of God in a while, please do so. I'm not even going to open the altar up for this this morning. I'm just going to say, go home to your prayer closet and seek God. More people get baptized in the Holy Spirit in their prayer closet than they ever do at an altar. Because it's not about emotional hype, it's about seeking the Lord with all your heart. The scripture says if you do that, you will find him. Our God is still the good God who gives good gifts to his children. And if you ask for that good gift, he will give it to you in abundance. God bless you. Have a fantastic week.